think maybe something that people don't think a lot about is uh, is the focus aspect of it. Like it's actually like they just they just kind of make you um, uh, forget about everything else that's going on in your life and really just focusing on your company. Yeah. Short question, you get a short answer. Um, all right, let's get started. Uh, so one of the things that makes ETL projects really complex is that there are a lot of stakeholders involved. You have uh, owners of source systems, you have developers, you have um, IT operations teams that care about inf uh, you know, infrastructure pieces being maintained, you have security teams that care about uh, data being kept safe, and you have analysts that uh, care about the data that the ETL system produces. And so in this talk, I'm going to focus on this last category of stakeholder, uh, which is a group that we find is often the last to get priority when ETL systems are built out. So first, I'm going to give you a model for how to think about their needs. Then I'm going to talk about ways that the systems that we as data engineers build um, often fall short. And I'll discuss ways that we can evolve those systems and improve them to better serve the analyst needs. And then second, I'm going to make the case for why it makes sense to make it an engineering priority to actually open up our ETL systems to analysts as well. And I'm, on purpose, I'm not uh, assuming any specific technology stacks in this talk, um, and I hope that there are some ideas that I bring up that are actually applicable to your systems. A bit about me first. I uh, have spent a decade as a developer in various data verticals, uh, first in search, then in ad tech, and now as the founder of an analytics-focused ETL company called Etleap. All right, let's dive in. So I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's theory states that the more basic needs, the ones at the bottom, um, need to be addressed before individuals will desire more higher level needs. And there's actually a uh, very similar or analogous hierarchy for data analysts. Um, basically, the higher level needs only matter once the lower level needs are taken care of. And I think they can be roughly classified as follows. So at the bottom, you have data being correct. And then going up, data being available, data being up to date, fast and clean access, and um, data completeness at the very top. So give me, let me give you a couple of examples. If I'm an analyst, if my data is out of date, say a day, I'm not, I'm not going to care about that if there's a good chance that the data that I do have access to and hence my analysis, are incorrect, right? Um, also, uh, I'm not going to care if my queries take 30 seconds or five minutes if I can't rely on my warehouse being up the whole day. So if your organization has analysts that feel like all these levels are taken care of, then well done. Your analysts have achieved self-actualization, <laughs> and they can spend uh, all of their time doing what they were actually hired to do, which is data analysis. But most of the ETL systems that I've seen, they fail in at least uh, one of these categories. And unfortunately, it's usually one of the lower ones. And that leads to uh, a lot of sweat, tears, and wasted time on the part of the analysts who have to get their job anyway. And so they work around the deficiencies of the ETL system uh, to get their job done and often with suboptimal results. All right, so let's dig in. Data correctness is the most fundamental um, of, these, of these needs, and building trust in your data is key. When analysts start distrusting the data, they'll say things like, uh, hey, my analysis isn't making sense today. Uh, is there something wrong with ETL pipelines again? And once that, once that becomes the norm, it's actually really hard to recover as an organization. ETL systems will never be perfect, and underlying infrastructure pieces are and will always be finicky. Uh, I, had, I once had a, uh, an issue where, for some reason, 
the MapReduce implementation I was using was not passing all the records from the mappers to the reducers. And so that's, that's an example of a, a data correctness issue that happens at a very low level, basically at the very bottom of the tech stack. But data correctness issues can occur pretty much at any level. And so a common one at basically the very top is where uh, data doesn't have the expected type, and so it's basically silently discarded by the transformation logic. We see this all the time. And uh, your analysts are not going to see that as a data bug, right? They're going to see that as something that's wrong uh, with the ETL system, and that's just something we as, as engineers have to, um, uh, have to make our, our, our systems resilient to. So again, there are always going to be issues. Systems are never going to be perfect. They need to evolve. Um, there are going to be bugs in the future, even if you fix all the bugs you have today. But if you can proactively uh, discover issues and let your analysts know about them, um, uh, that actually goes a long way in maintaining their trust. And one technique that's super basic, uh, but is yield a surprisingly high number of, or detected rather, a surprisingly high number of, uh, of issues in practice is just comparing counts. So uh, if you basically take counts uh, at extraction time and compare them with counts uh, of the data once the data has been loaded, uh, for example, if your, your source, if, let's say you're extracting records from some source and the source API has a concept of number of records, then you can, um, you can basically get that at the time of extraction and then run a SQL query once the data has been loaded to get the count once the data has been loaded and compare the two. Now, in order for this to work, the count has to be taken at pretty much exactly the same time as the data is extracted. And for many sources, that's a hard thing to do. So in many cases, you actually have to allow for a small degree of mismatch. But if you uh, automate this and uh, you know, run, run this check periodically, say once a day, uh, and then alert on mismatches, that can go a long way in, in starting to create a, uh, uh, a data monitoring system. Everyone with me so far? All right, good. One of the most annoying problems that analysts face is data being unavailable. And this is typically due to some infrastructure component going down or a change in the ETL system that leads to uh, the system getting into a bad state. And the consequence is that analysts can't do their job for a while. Uh, typically until uh, one of us developers has looked into it, deployed a fix, and waited for the system to catch up. In general, availability is about making each of the components of the system as robust as possible. And as you know, component availability is multiplicative. So if you have uh, three components, like this very simple system here, um, each, if each of these components is available 99% of the time, then your system as a whole is going to be available about 97% of the time. So one simple trick here is to uh, separate out the system that analysts access from the rest of the pipeline so that its availability doesn't factor into this calculation. Um, if you're doing ELT as opposed to ETL, that could mean separating out the database where you're doing transformations from the database where analysts are running queries. A related idea is to maximize atomicity. So if you separate your data processing into uh, logical units of work and apply them atomically, say um, you're running an ETL job daily and it's going through different stages that finally loads into a, a data warehouse, you can make sure that this last step here is atomic. And this way, if any processing step fails or takes a while, you can uh, uh, assure that analysts aren't prevented from doing their jobs and they'll be happier. If your warehouse is a database that supports transactions, then this is really straightforward to do. Um, if your warehouse is based on some file store, say uh, Presto or Athena, then you can load to uh, basically a, a scratch location in the file system and only update the meta store once your load is actually complete. And this principle can be extended to uh, uh, pipelines as well, like the whole, the whole pipeline as well. So say you have a change that leads to the whole uh, pipeline having to be recomputed. Um, 
there's going to be a lot of backfill, and analysts will understand that this is going to take a while, right? But at the same time, these analysts have analysis that actually depend on this data being available, right? And so um, rather than uh, having them wait for everything complete, to complete, treat this, this whole recomputation as a unit of work and leave the existing data in place until it's completed, and then you can make an atomic switch at the end. Uh, and for extra credit, you could even keep deltas flowing through the original pipeline here. Um, and that actually brings me to the next level of the hierarchy, which is data being available. Sorry, data being up to date. There we go. Um, once the data is correct and analysts have pretty high confidence that uh, um, it's going to be available the vast majority of the time, this is the next thing that they're going to care about. Now, as engineers, we are used to uh, monitoring infrastructure components. And that's important in ETL as well, right? You need to make sure that everything is, is up most of the time. Um, however, just doing that is usually not enough to keep the uh, analyst happy, because there are other reasons why, uh, why data could be delayed as well. So for example, there could be a data issue that leads to a transformation failing, um, an unexpected schema change that the system doesn't know how to deal with, uh, or a spike in load, right? A spike in uh, source data volumes that leads to a, a processing delay. <clears throat> Rob Yershuk was a site reliability engineer at Google, and he wrote this blog post that's really good about how they monitor systems there. And the theme of this blog post is that you should focus your monitoring of, on symptoms of what users care about rather than the causes. And that's sometimes a subtle uh, point, but at the same time, it's often critically important in, um, in keeping you know, nighttime wake-up calls um, as well as alert neglect to a minimum. So in the context of data analysis, uh, monitoring what users, or monitoring the symptoms of what users care about includes monitoring data delays. Um, so if you can make that information about data delays available to your analysts, um, uh, you're, you're basically keeping, uh, keeping them informed, and that way you know, you've told them instead of uh, you know, analysts finding out about it through, through their own queries, which is a, a, you know, it's much better that you tell them, basically. Um, also, you can have high priority alerts on, the, on data delays that users really care about, and then proactively uh, uh, work to fix these issues when they occur to reduce the total time that the data is not up to date. Another idea for reducing delays is to distinguish between retriable and non-retriable errors. So an example of a retriable error is a network error or a transaction deadlock. And a, an example of a non-retriable error would be you know, a set of credentials no longer working. Right, so the reason for making this distinction is that they should usually be handled in very different ways. So in the, in the first category, a retriable error should, by definition, be retried ad infinitum, whereas uh, a non-retriable error should lead to alerts that need to be handled immediately to avoid data delays. All right, moving on. Uh, we're now getting out of the territory of analyst enablement and into the territory of helping them be as effective as they can be at their jobs. So here are a few examples of data cleanliness issues. These are, I mean, in terms of data engineering, it's mostly obvious how to deal with these. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but um, and in many cases, you just have to be reactive. One guiding principle that I've found useful is to learn the details of the SQL language that analysts use and focus engineering attention on uh, transformations that um, you know, prevent them from being limited in how they can execute queries. So here is a favorite example of mine. This is uh, basically how you get to the maximum value from uh, a JSON array that's stored in a text field in Amazon Redshift. So the first thing you do is you create a sequence table. It contains uh, numbers, just numbers, from zero up to the, uh, you know, whatever you believe is the maximum length of the array. Then you create a common table expression that joins the sequence table to the table itself and you use a couple of JSON functions to extract the elements as well as the, uh, the length of the array. And then you can finally get the, the maximum value there at the bottom. So this is clearly really cumbersome. And it would have been much better for analysts if 
we had uh, uh, transformed this JSON array into a table up front. Analysts expect their queries or be able to, analysts expect to be able to do their, their analysis at interactive speeds. So uh, for ad hoc queries, that usually means, you know, 20 or 30 seconds at most for a query to return. And the good news is that uh, data warehousing te technology has come a long way in recent years. And so, you know, you get a lot of this for free. Um, but oftentimes we have to make performance optimizations anyway. So here are a few ideas. Um, this list is, is an increasing order of uh, setup and maintenance complexity. So I recommend considering, uh, considering these ideas in, in this order. The first is to take advantage of optimizations that the data warehouse itself offers, like um, columnar compression, indexing, good data distribution, reducing the width of string fields, and so on. And uh, a nice thing about these kinds of optimizations is that typically you don't need to talk to anyone when you do them. Um, you can just look at query logs, you can look at, you can understand the data warehousing technology itself and, um, and just make, make the changes um, or get the information you need to make the changes. Um, if that doesn't cut it, you can find uh, hotspots and typically uh, identify some parts of large data sets that are uh, that are, are looked at or queried less often than others. Um, analysts tend to look at recent data more frequently than old data, and so uh, you can exploit that sort of popularity skew in the data and, um, um, uh, and, and, uh, and partition, so, um, and actually physically partition the data. So most warehouses today are columnar, columnar meaning that uh, vertical partitioning is often less impactful, but this kind of horizontal partitioning is, is, can still make a big difference. So after discovering your, uh, your partition dimension, you can use the partitioning features of the data warehouse, or you can uh, uh, create a retention policy that actually uh, retires data, uh, old data from the warehouse. All right, if that's not good enough, then uh, you'll want to materialize views. And most, most teams do this in one form or another. And you know, the idea here is that you pre-build partial answers to questions that, uh, that analysts may ask. And this adds complexity, because this creation has to be managed. And actually creating the materialized views and refreshing them um, is a time-consuming process. And that means that the data in them is going to be out of date. And, um, uh, and it also leads to resource contention with analytical workloads as well. So, so these issues lead me to the final idea that I have for you here, which is to push data processing out of the data warehouse. And this means typically taking those materialized views or materializations and actually computing them up front and then loading them into the warehouse with, with the data. Um, and th the advantages are that you avoid the inconsistencies between the materialized views and the source data. Uh, you reduce resource contention. And if you do it well, you can actually avoid data being um, out of date as well. And the challenge here is that it typically involves uh, re-implementing some of this materialization logic, and it also requires additional uh, coordination in terms of computing and, and, uh, and processing. The final obstacle to analyst self-actualization is completeness. Do they have access to all the, the data that they need? And the paradox here is that uh, if you do a really good job at these lower levels, th that can actually exacerbate this problem. So uh, what I mean is, if analysts find that they have fast access to up-to-date data, they're going to start asking more questions. And then they're going to need more data from, from more sources. Moving on to the second part of the talk, which I promise is much shorter than the first. Uh, here's a slide that shows typical ETL and data warehousing tasks on a technical complexity spectrum. And a small disclaimer here, I'm making a ton of assumptions. Um, and in your case, the relative positioning of these tasks is probably different from this. If, and if you're building um, uh, you know, ETL pipelines from scratch, you're probably doing most of these tasks yourself. 
And perhaps you're enabling, uh, perhaps you're enabling analysts to do, uh, to do ad hoc, you know, to, to run ad hoc queries and building reports. So you know that's basically what's on the left of the red line here, and and you're probably doing uh, most of what's on the right. So I believe that it's a worthwhile engineering goal to try and push this, push this red line to the right. And let me explain why. So first, by by doing so, we're forcing. Uh, ourselves to build systems that evolve with the data. And there are two nice consequences of this. The more obvious one is that this sort of upfront investment actually yields dividends in the form of fewer code changes down the line. And by the way, those code changes are, are, very, uh, are always going to be urgent because analysts are waiting when you have to make them, which cause, uh, causes unavailability, which we've already discussed. A less obvious consequence is that it helps decouple analytical from operational data systems. <clears throat> so, you know, a very simple example of that is if you're a developer and you're involved with both sides, both the operational side and the analytical side, then you might be reluctant to make, uh, say, a, a schema change to an application database on the operational side because you know that it's going to uh, lead you to have to do work on the analytical side afterwards. So in other words, by, being, by creating systems that are adaptive to changes upstream, uh, we can actually be more effective as, uh, as engineers outside of ETL. For analysts, the key here is the time and effort that it takes to get their job done. Um, in many organizations, uh, it looks like this. They have a new question that they're asking, and they realize that you know, just running ad hoc queries is, uh, you know, they, they basically don't have the data that they need. Uh, to, to answer their question. And so what do they do? Well, they, they come to the engineering team and they ask for it. They, you know, they believe that the data exists somewhere, they just don't have access to it. <clears throat> and once the engineering team has time, what we do is we, we, um, uh, we figure out how to get the data and we, we get the analyst a sample. And what follows is a period of back and forth where the analyst will ask for clarifications and we do more ad hoc work to, uh, you know, to, 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 to get the analysts what they need. And finally, they'll have an answer to their original question. And now they find that this analysis is actually pretty useful. And so they'll, uh, you know, they'll want to uh, have access to that data on a sort of on-demand or an uh, on-demand basis and actually have up-to-date data. And so uh, they come back to data engineering and they ask us to build a, a pipeline for them. Um, I'm sure this sounds familiar to some of you. <clears throat> this is a, a cycle that can take weeks or months, and uh, we've seen it lead to a lot of unhappiness uh, and a lot of great analysis not being done. So by pushing this line to the right, we're basically shortening this loop for the analysts, and, and by basically removing ourselves from the equation, and this is just one example. I'm sure you can imagine similar cycles with, with other tasks on this spectrum. So, and finally, when it comes to building trust uh, in an organization, it's basically much better that analysts can come to their own conclusions uh, about data correctness. So if, for example, you're, you're exposing statistics to them about how much data was ingested, how much data couldn't be processed because it was considered bad, um, analysts are basically much, much less likely to blame the uh, ETL system when the when their, when their reports aren't showing the results they expect. So today I've given you, I uh, hope I've impressed on you the importance of considering the needs of data analysts when building ETL systems. I talked about the order um, in which analysts care about data issues and why it makes sense to actually let the, the analysts in on, on uh, some parts of the ETL system. Um, and I hope that some of these ideas are applicable to the systems that you're building. Very quick plug at the end. Uh, Atleap is hiring developers. We're looking for people who are uh, interested in hard problems and building robust, scalable uh, systems that are focused on analytics. Um, and so if that sounds like you, please get in touch. Thank you.
question on it. Uh, how do you handle the deployment of your ETL code? And uh, given the data environment is changing and data warehouse schema is changing, how do you QA it and the new data source being at? Do you, mean, do you mean how do we do it in particular, or how do you do it in general? Uh, what's your best practice? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, got it. Yeah. I think I think it's sort of a it's it's really dependent on your stack, right? Exactly how you do that. Um, uh, yeah. So I I don't want to get too stack specific here, but I think um, this this concept of having a that's fine. Um, having a, a, a deployment process where the, the new stuff gets deployed in, in parallel with the old stuff. So there's sort of a warm up period where what it does doesn't, you know, is, isn't, um, doesn't affect the, the analytics team, right? And then uh, only once you're sure that uh, everything is up to date and it kind of satisfies all the levels of the hierarchy, right? At that point, you kind of flip the switch. Um, so I, I know that's that's kind of generic, but that's that's the principle that we typically follow. All right. Uh, sorry. So so you mentioned uh, pushing some computation for the materialized views into the ETL process as opposed to on you know on the um, on the analyst side. So do you do you have any thoughts about how you um, like how you go about keeping? The data sort of consistent and like queries running across uh, across the time period that you're. Um, I'm, I'm I'm sorry, but like like if you have to correct some data, do you do you have any thoughts about like how you might keep that consistent and like queries running across sort of the older version of the materialized view versus the newer version, like how they might uh, like reconcile differences? Uh, is that Sorry, is that when you, are you talking about when you change the materialized views or? Yes, yeah, so you're performing some computation in the ETL layer, yeah. um, you know, for, for downstream, but then suppose that you realize that there's a, there's a bug in that code or something and you have to recompute. Yeah. Um, yeah, is there, uh, do, you, do, do you have any, um, any thoughts on like how you manage that basically and make sure that queries don't get both old versions and new versions or, you know? Um. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I understand exactly what you mean. Do you mean, you mean if you're fixing a bug to the materialization code itself, or? Yes, yeah, so you might have an, an older version of, of the materialized view that might have a mistake in it, and then at the same time you're creating a new version of that data. Yeah. Right, um, but then your queries might be running against both the old and new versions at the same time, like is there? Is oh, there, I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, my, my answer is going to be very similar to my previous answer. We, we try to, um, uh, or, or what we found is it's best to kind of keep, uh, keep the new and old completely separate from each other and do the, do the complete recomputation first, right, um, before you really touch the old stuff at all, and then, and then make an atomic switch um, so that, you know, you never have queries that are, like, a query would only be touching one or the other. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if that really answered your question. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Hi, I have a two-part question. So the second part is related to the first one. So in the first question, I have this query that do you think that data analysts and data engineers should be involved from the beginning in the project planning? Because in my experience, I felt that there's a general disconnect between the data warehouse and the requirements that the analyst feel that they need to have. So we end up doing a lot of rework, or if we might even have to go back in the reiterative cycle. Second, if you think that the first part can coexist, like we can have a mutually agreeable data model, then can an ETL warehouse system be developed which will be self-sustaining, implying that you don't need to refresh the data, it can be handled automatically, or maybe minimal effort can be required, and likewise, the data requirement that the analyst would have would be comparatively easier for them to get and much, much easier for the data engineer to manage. Thank you. Yes. Good questions. Sorry, let me, let me go back to this slide. So, uh, so yes, absolutely. Include your analysts as early as possible in the process, right? It's kind of like 
it's kind of like building a new system or building a new product, right? You want to understand the requirements first, right? Like before you do anything. So, uh, so yeah, by involving analysts early, it, 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 it just helps in many ways later. And then the second part, um, yeah, like, you know, there's, there's an initial investment, right? When you build systems that, that, that can evolve, right? Like it's, it's, it's hard. It's not easy to push this line to the right, but, um, but basically by doing so, uh, it makes life easier for everybody, right? It makes life easier for, for analysts who get a sort of shorter cycle time in getting their work done. And it, it makes our job easier as well because there is sort of less, um, th there's less stuff we have to manage and be involved in. Um, and so what we find is, is um, uh, when, when engineers are able to do this, they can, they can kind of leave, um, sort of leave this behind and focus on more, more interesting projects. Um, um, yeah, typically most of these tasks there are not super interesting from an engineering perspective. Yeah, I was just wondering, could you give us an example of, you know, how do you move that line to the right? I mean, uh, what are some things in, in your organization that you've done or, or things that you've seen done that actually enables that line to move to the right and, you know, pushing tasks kind of off the engineering palette and, and into the hands of the analysts? So uh, there are many ways of going about it. Um, and I think... Um, sound like a broken record here, but it's kind of stack dependent. Um, so, you know, you can, you can actually, some of this you can, you can solve with, uh, uh, with a good BI tool, right? Like say you're using Looker and you can actually, you know, have the analysts create the data model and, and uh, materializations through the tool itself. Um, yeah, let's see, what are, what are other things you can do? Um, you can, um, um, another thing that, that works well is to have a pretty strict schema for uh, data that your uh, teams produce uh, locally, right? So you can, um, you know, if you're using Kafka, for example, to publish, uh, publish data internally, then you can have, um, you can develop methods for, uh, for actually evolving the schemas, right? You never want to lock yourself to a schema, but you can, um, you know, if you're using uh, Confluent Schema Registry, for example, you can actually create, um, you know, as, as developers, you can create a, um, a, a method for how, how your teams evolve schemas over time, right? So, so that goes a long way in, in, uh, in, in you know, not, not having to uh, worry too much about schema evolution in your, in your transformation logic. Um, yeah, those are a couple of, couple of examples. So, so my question is how, say data engineering balance between um, say batch data versus streaming data. So does your have any suggestion? Um, say if you do the batch data, uh, a simpler approach because you don't handle all the di uh, differences, updates, um, because basically you can go back reload something or because some data are time sensitive, say status changes. Right, so even though the source data may actually be incremental, but some of those um, dimensions or facts could change afterwards. Um, how do you handle a situation like that? Say, for example, there's a flag, right? Right now is um, said okay, but after two days, right, you get a response. So we have a customer who actually uh, measure the kind of uh, engagement of the customer, right? So that engagement means, say, two days later it's in the email, then that flag changes. So how, how you say, how you handle, say, for example, the, um, in the batch level handling or versus streaming level handling, or also how to handle kind of unexpected uh, data changes? So uh, the first thing I would do is figure out what do your analysts want? Right, like what, how, do, how do they want to see these, these changes reflected um, in, in the data that they're querying, right? So they might want um, uh, snapshots, right? They might want uh, historical views. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't actually think that whether you're doing batch processing or streaming processing, you know, what kind of architecture you have um, 
you know, it, it, it's, it's not like you can only do one or the other, right, with, you know, depending on, on which, uh, which, which sort of data processing architecture you have. So, uh, um, yeah, so I don't, I, don't think, I don't think that necessarily has a direct impact. Um, um, yeah, I think that's all I said about that. So I'm wondering, in that distinction, is there, do you think it's possible that you can shift that? Now, I don't know if you specified, but if, like, if you can actually move that line maybe a little further to the right or left, but it would depend on what kind of people you have, for example. You think sh shifted depending on like where it ends up kind of depends like for on what example, kind of person you have? Yeah, like I, I don't know how many analysts would have the skill set to handle all that. So I don't know like if you had to experience like yeah. say data engineers training analysts so yeah. that they can pick up those skills. Right. Or you just say like on the job description that's what it, yeah. you know, it, you should be able to handle all those skills as well. Yeah. Seems like it's pretty rare. Yeah. Yeah, so, so clarification here. What I mean by pushing this line to the right is, 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 is not training, right? Like, I, I don't, I, I don't, um, wh what I mean is uh, we can build systems that actually uh, let the analysts do this stuff in ways that make sense to them, right? So it requires abstractions and it requires uh, tool, tool support. Um, and I, I see a lot of, uh, I, you know, I, I, see, I see a lot of job descriptions that ask for, you know, skills on both sides, right? You know, you have to be, a, a, you know, you have to be a super detail-oriented analyst. But you, you know, by the way, you also need to know how to operate Spark, right? Like, th th those people. I mean, there there are some of them, but they're really hard to find. And um, uh, and I certainly advise the companies that we work with to try and try and focus their effort on finding people who are really good at one or the other and not both. So, so yeah, what I really mean here is, uh, you know, build systems that, um, that give the analyst tools to do things in the way that makes sense to them. <laughs>